put this film together for our communities to hear these voices, to hear what people couldn't say, didn't say, didn't feel able to say, didn't feel they had a platform to say during the postal survey period. I just want to start by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Kulin Nation and paying my respects to um, their elders past, present and future. The postal vote meant a lot to me and um, went some way to bring me in to the inside. I often say um, I'm on the inside of Aboriginal culture um, because I'm an Aboriginal person, uh, but I'm on the outside because I'm a queer person and then I'm on the inside of queer culture because I'm a queer person and then on the outside of that because I'm an, I have a different cultural um, take. If we're maturing as a community, as the LGBTIQ community, then I think we can be starting to have discussions about diversity in a much better, much more meaningful way. So this would look like, hopefully, a respectful, engaging discussion that understands difference rather than vilifies difference. You know, there's still a lot of discussion, for example, at the Pride Centre level uh, around who is in, who is out, who's allowed to come, who's not allowed to come. And that, you know, these are really difficult discussions in a community that's already been marginalised from the heterosexual point of view. Uh, but we are very good at marginalising within our community as well, unfortunately. So if we can start that much more mature debate around diversity, what does it really mean, how does it look, and how do we embrace diversity really properly? I think there's quite a lot of missing voices from the multicultural communities. Um, quite a lot of the campaign that was available out there, um, including all the resources and all the um, visibility, was very much an Anglo-dominated um, spectrum. And it felt like we were being sidelined. Either it is, I don't think it is deliberate, I don't think it is malicious, but I think what is happening with the postal survey, it was too big. It was so much that needs to be covered in the very, very short period of time that unfortunately for marginalised communities, we are being marginalised again. That kind of pressure to assimilate and not talk about the things that make us different um, was something I really felt. I felt like there was this pressure to be grateful and to be silent about um, the things that I found really difficult about the debate. It was called same-sex marriage and not marriage between two people erased a lot of members of our community, the trans and gender diverse community. Marriage is not the most important issue in any sort of grassroots queer environment I've been in and to have it foregrounded as the big issue and the holy grail of the queer struggle was actually silencing, especially because there's a long history of critiques of marriage from queer, from queers and feminists as like an institution. It was almost like a hit in the face as well because they said, you know, they want us to tick these boxes, yet uh, uh, visually and vocally the voice is still missing and you know that that engagement with you know with the wider rainbow community i felt was very important because we were all affected i remember one day i was wheeling down a street in richmond and i just started crying and i'm not the kind of person that cries very easily at all like i normally find actually getting brought to tears really hard even in private let alone in a public kind of space and I realised that while I'd intellectualised a lot of what was happening to me in my community, the emotional gravity of what we were actually having to go through and some of the you know homophobic and transphobic and biphobic comments that were coming out in the media because of the survey were really, really impacting me and my partner and my friends and our community. I was forced into supporting saying yes for something I don't believe in, a fading heterosexual institution that's not relevant to me. It can be like one movement. I didn't experience that as one movement. I didn't experience it as um, like this campaign, which could lead to future campaigns. I experienced it as like damaging to trans people and their sense of 
rights? It was difficult within our family, actually. There was a lot of um, expectations that everybody would be supportive, and I'm not the only person in my family affected by this survey. Um, and But there were sort of doubts, I think, in some people's minds as to whether anybody was going to vote or how they were going to vote at times. The fact that it was celebrating love and coupledom and relationships as these amazing, wonderful things. Um, and they are, but they're not amazing and wonderful 100% of the time. So for many people who had um, been in relationships that had broken down or had separated from their partners and were creating and reforming new families or for people in family violence or domestic violence situations, or people that were really struggling with their parenting, they did report to um, myself and other members of Rainbow Families that it was really hard not to ask for help at that time if that was going on. That if they did, they were letting the side down. We drove one day through Collingwood and they were just like glued to the windows going, oh, look at all the yes posters, oh my God, it's Rainbow Heaven. And they were so pleased and it was so beautiful to watch them knowing that they'd been exposed at school to um, kids who had brought to school attitudes that were not as supportive as the ones in our family. And it was just really nice to know that they saw the good and the bad and they were still hopeful that it would be a yes. Our leaders at the top in many ways lacked the political courage to give it a go, um, to call on a vote and perhaps held um, more value on the security of their jobs. And when you're dealing with people's lives, I think that is a, a very selfish way to decide to hold a survey, simply to placate certain members of your party room. There was one comment though that got me personally, and that was the comments both made by both Tony Abbott and Matt Canavan, the gist of which there is no more discrimination against LGBTIQ people, which of course everyone in queer communities knows is, well, I'll say malarkey, given that this will be public, you fill in your own word. One of the um, really horrifying parts of the debate um, was watching reports and imagery from Parliament where these old, rich, cis, white men debated the fate um, and like legal outcomes of LGBTIQA people's um, relationships. And I think that's really confronting, but I think it's also really um, testament to who has control and power in this country. For many of us, the, the, the media coverage and the sorts of arguments that were presented really had virtually nothing to do with marriage equality and same-sex marriage. So we saw um, a lot of attacks on other elements and other people within the LGBTIQ community um, with really nothing at all related to why individuals and couples shouldn't have the same rights to get married as anyone else in our society. The most heartbreaking thing that happened after the postal survey is the use of the Western Sydney um, results to in a way, almost justify racism that already exists in the LGBTIQ community. And especially those of us, including myself, who identify as a, as a Muslim, it was very difficult because suddenly we are being demonized as a community that is anti-progress. And there's been many, many conversations where, once again, it's left to us to fend for ourselves. Members of my family uh, certainly recently really, really focus on the fact that the yes vote won and that that should sort of eclipse everything, uh, all feelings of hurt or anything else with that. And so for them, who aren't gay or, uh, you know, aren't really involved, it's sort of like, yeah, 60%, how great. But for someone who is affected by it, the 40% is, it's 40% of people who voted want you to not have human rights, think that you're not the same. 62% of, 80% of Australians think that you deserve this ridiculous equal right it was so much lower than I had believed previously. So actually, when 
when uh, the vote was done and dusted and people were saying, you must be so happy, I was actually thinking, you know, I feel kind of shit because that's not the number that I was carrying around in my head if you had have asked me to put forward a number before the vote. I had a, multiple people congratulate me on the result that it was a yes. But I, you know, I just felt kind of vacant inside. I did I was a little bit numb and actually a little bit angry is how I felt when we found out it was a yes. I'm like, oh great, so we had to do all of this. I was overcome with like an unusual amount of rage that I don't usually feel as a response to the way that queer people were expected to celebrate and celebrate in the context of being put through like this horrific process and celebrate in the context of winning but not even really winning at a campaign which to me is like not even yeah the most um, important campaign to my mind that needs to be fought. Marriage really wasn't what I campaigned on. I campaigned on equality and I do think this is an amazing step forward for LGBTI young people to see that they live in a country that one of those iconic symbolic rituals in our lives and that being marriage is now something that they can dream about and enjoy, just like we want them to dream about and enjoy the idea that they can create their own rainbow family in the future. Yes, it should have been done a long time ago, and yes, it was done in a pathetic way, which actually hurt a lot of people in the process. But the fact that we got the vote, it just means that the kids that are in school now can be queer and gay and however they identify and that is considered normal. What parts of my life do I experience the most violence? And it's, it's not the newspaper articles around the marriage stuff, it's actually can be the nuclear family, the rejection from employers, from welfare systems um, and, and cuts to welfare systems. That's like where a lot of interpersonal and administrative sort of violence plays out and I don't really see that coming up. Now that marriage has been achieved, anything is really different for the lived realities of queer people who are living at the margins. What we have now are homonormative and cisnormative queer people who have the rights that they have been seeking to achieve, but not necessarily the rights that the rest of us have been campaigning for many decades uh, in pursuit of. Yeah, I keep thinking about where to from here. And I think when you feel really far away from equality, really far away from achieving real equality, it's really hard to imagine what that'll look like in my life, in our lives. I feel like how the community heals from this experience is much the same to how we've coped and survived throughout, you know, historically, I guess, my elders and their elders. And that is uh, to, to not isolate, to connect in with each other, to, um, to celebrate each other when others don't have the capacity to. Take what's happened through the postal survey, you know, the fact that our lives were scrutinised as queer people, um, and realise that that has happened to Aboriginal people for eons, you know, since colonisation for the last 200 and something years. You know, it should have given the queer community some empathy towards other people and how they're scrutinised by the media and their lives are um, surveilled and um, watched. We now have the opportunity, I think, to have a bigger discussion. What do relationships really look like in our community? They're much more than two same-sex people joining together forever. They're, they're about people extending what a relationship can mean. Trans people are feeling very hurt. Bi people are feeling very hurt. The ones I can speak for, as I say, intersex, multicultural, sex workers, um, all those groups have felt very, very shamed and we're going to have to work out a way where we can have an overarching approach and then do specific areas at the same time so we can move down, we'll say, rather than a slippery slope, a gentle incline to a level playing field of equity within queer and sex positive communities. As we pick ourselves up and ask how do we heal now and how do we act now, 
We think that these voices from the community will help us to do both.